हेलो एवरी वन हटी वेलकम गुड इवनिंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड मॉर्निंग डिपेंडिंग ऑन वॉट एवर एरिया ऑफ द ग्लोब यू आर इन वेलकम टू द फोर्टी सेकेंड सेशन इन नव लर्न फ्रॉम द लेजेंड्स वेबिनार सीरीज टूडे वी हैव अनदर लेजेंड टू टेल अस हाउ टू ऑप्टिमाइज डेलीवरी इन ए प्री टर्म बेबी प्रोफेसर संदीप Hari Gopal. Sandeep is a consultant neonatologist in Newcastle upon Tyne Hospital and works with Newcastle University with over 25 years of experience in the field of neonatology and pediatrics. He did his medical training and post graduation in pediatrics from India before moving on to UK and uh, he took his specialist training in neonatology in Liverpool and Manchester. Sandeep's broad interests include system changes, quality improvement, and research. He is currently clinical lead for Northern Neonatal Network and successfully led the reconfiguration of neonatal intensive care services in the north of England, development of a standalone Northern Neonatal Transport Service, and is currently leading the implementation of the National Neonatal Critical Review across the northeast of England. he has experience as an external expert in neonatal service reviews as a member of the national neonatal clinical reference group he advises national health services on clinical commissioning policies in his role as neonatal lead for the maternity and neonatal safety improvement program he leads quality improvement programs by developing methods to improve, implement proven in interventions across northeast of england His researching uh, interests include respiratory mechanics of so high flow oxygen, severe BPD, as well as MRI and spectroscopy in brain injury, and has undertaken research and published various papers in these areas. He also has special interest in training and is regional program director for National Neonatal Grid Training UK and runs an international neonatal fellowship program in Newcastle. So, with these words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen let's hear from professor sandeep hari gobal how to optimize uh, pre term birth after that we will have a, an interesting panel discussion moderated by two leading neonatologists from india dr ravi shankar and dr mamda jaju i may request all of you to kindly post your questions in the q and a box not in the chat box chat box is primarily meant for housekeeping announcements and greetings So welcome to yet another edition of Learn from the Legends. Over to the legend Sandeep. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for your kind introduction. I don't know if I'm a legend, but I'm here to come and share my experiences uh, with you. But may I first begin by saying uh, uh, a big thank you for inviting me to talk to you uh, and sharing my experience, but also congratulate you and your team. Um, for this excellent program that you put together uh, i have looked at some of your previous talks and i think it, it is a vast repository of information for both trainees as well as consultants um now i'm going to try and share you my screen so you just need to give me just give me a minute Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, yes, yes. Now we can make it full screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So I have to admit um, that I have taken the liberty to slightly alter the title of the talk uh, from current concepts, and I have grayed out the future because when I was putting the talk together, uh, I realized that there is so much of uh, information currently um, that. you know we i would not be able to do any justice to try and talk about the future as well so just briefly about me you've already mentioned most of it and uh, i come from newcastle upon tyne uh, which is um, a city in the north east of england a beautiful city and you can see the tyne river there and i work in uh, the rvi as a consultant neonatologist uh, this is a large tertiary uh, center Uh, which is both the regional center for fetal medicine as well as uh, surgery and 
as a clinical lead for the Northern Neonatal Network, you know, I uh, oversee 10 um, neonatal units and primarily in terms of service development for the units as well as quality improvement. And I work closely with the Academic Health Science Network to lead on uh, quality improvement programs. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, uh, I would also try to impress upon you the importance of quality improvement. Uh, there's a lot of evidence out there, but it is about translating that to um, practice and how we can do that. And finally, I work with the Newcastle University, um, both uh, doing research in respiratory mechanics, but also um, in my role as, a, uh, as an educationist. Now, enough said about me, we'll move on to the why we're here. Uh, about 15 million babies are born preterm annually um, worldwide, and preterm birth is a leading cause of death amongst children. A third of all these deaths occur within the newborn period itself, and this is very high in the southeast of Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, with India accounting for almost a third of the total global deaths due to preterm birth. And therefore, a very important aspect to see how we best optimize preterm birth. Now, this is an interesting statistic that shows the difference between high income and low income countries when it comes to lack of resources. So on an average, 50% survival at 24 weeks in high income countries compared to 50% survival at 32 weeks in low income countries. Now, I recognize that this is an average and there will be some places doing a lot better than this but an important statistic to bear in mind. Now, this slide is more relevant to centers that look after babies at the extremes of gestation, but still uh, tells a story uh, that the survival uh, is quite low in the extremes of gestation, as low as three, per, uh, three out of 10 babies survive at 22 weeks gestation. And this is a lot better by the time they are 26 weeks gestation with eight in 10 babies surviving. But they all have severe they can they all can have severe disability as well, and therefore it's about how we optimize all this. Just a caveat here that these are babies who actually are admitted to the intensive care unit and not necessarily at the onset of labor, which means to say the survival could be a lot poorer than the numbers you've just seen here. Many of them are interested in the severe impairment of these babies, um, and rightly so. So if you were to define severe uh, impairment as severe cognitive impairment with an IQ less than 55, where the child needs uh, special educational needs or, or supervision for daily activities, or have cerebral palsy, severe cerebral palsy, blindness, or profound hearing loss, then the, the uh, data currently shows that one in three survivors uh, at 22 weeks will have severe impairment, and one in 10 survivors will have severe impairment at 26 weeks. Now, this data comes from England, from Sweden, and from America, and I recognize that it may be different in different parts of the world. Um, but more importantly, I think this is probably an underestimate. This talks only about severe impairment, at 18 to 24 months and therefore needs to be taken with some degree of caution. Here you can see that actually disability changes over time because you don't actually pick up moderate disability as early as two and a half years. And this becomes more apparent when the child's growing. And by the time they're 11 years old, it's more than 50% of them have moderate to severe disability. And this was well, it showed very well in the Epicure cohort. It's not just disability, is it? It's also about the cognitive impairment. And uh, here's a nice uh, study that shows that the mean IQ scores are significantly lower in the extreme preterm babies compared to those of the term uh, counterparts. In fact, by 11 years, 40% of those less than 20, 26 weeks have an intellectual disability when it's only compared to 1.4% in term infants. And this carries on by 11 years, uh, when you look at academic attainment and special educational needs, those who are born extremely preterm have much lower IQ, much lower scores when it comes to cognitive ability, reading or mathematics. 
And more than 50% of uh, extremely preterm children had special educational needs. And by 19 years, even adult born preterms continue to perform lower than their term born peers with general cognitive abilities as well as across a range of neuropsychological functions. And just one final slide about the economic impact. Now, this is a slide just talking about a snapshot of what happens at six years. And in fact, it comes, to, comes from a 2006 paper, so quite an old one, but it just shows the difference in cost of looking after a child with extreme prematurity compared to someone who is term. And this is at the age of six, and we know that the cost is much higher early on. Now, what I, I hope I've been able to do is impress upon why it is extremely important to try and focus on what we can do best for uh, optimizing the care of these preterm babies and, and reduce their morbidity. There are a number of interventions that we can undertake um, to optimize a preterm baby. And here I've just highlighted a few of them. Um, and clearly we can be here all day if we were to talk about each of those interventions. But what I would like to do is highlight the ones that I've highlighted in green are the ones I would like to talk about because they are either easy wins or there is very good evidence uh, uh, basis to try and uh, maximize their usage. So here, what we you, you could divide optimization into three groups effectively. So antenatally, op, antenatal optimization, peripartum optimization, and subsequently postnatal optimization or interventions postnatally to reduce morbidity. And if you take antenatal optimization, um, there are a few things, a few factors that need to be taken into account. Place of birth, um, which is an important one, antenatal steroids, magnesium sulfate, and maternal antibiotics. And when you look at post peripartum optimization, optimum cord management, normothermia, and early breast, uh, breast milk. Now, let's try and talk about each of those interventions. So place of birth, in the United Kingdom, uh, we have three levels of care, uh, and it might be useful to understand a little bit to understand the, um, the slide a bit better. So the, there's uh, level one, level two, and level three. So all babies beyond above 32 weeks will be looked after in a level one center. Uh, babies above 27 weeks will be looked after in level two center. And babies of all gestations right from 22 weeks can be looked after in a level three center. And what this showed was, this um, study showed was that if a baby was looked after in a level three center and was not transferred out for neonatal care, then the survival outcomes were much better than those who are either looked after in a level one center or level two center, and then subsequently transferred to a level three center. So this is a very important aspect in recognizing that we need to ensure that babies are born in the right places. Just by the place of birth itself has a significant impact. The second half of the slide is about the busyness of a unit. The higher activity a unit undertakes, the outcomes of those units are much better than those who have lower activity. So as you can see in this slide, um, the activity here is uh, defined as 2000 intensive care days. So those who undertook higher intensive care activity uh, had much better outcomes. And again, this is something to take into account, but I recognize that different health settings have different setups and therefore may not necessarily be relevant. Antenatal steroids, we all know that antenatal steroids are you know, effective and we all believe that most of our mothers receive antenatal steroids uh, when they go into preterm labor before they're born. But is that really the case? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about what's more recent uh, as opposed to what we already know. Uh, this was a prospective cohort study of over 100,000 infants born between 23 weeks and 24 weeks. And apologies for the slide, it's rather small and not very clear. 
uh, but I will talk you through it. Uh, what it talks about is various gestations uh, horizontally and vertically you can see um, the outcomes, death before discharge and severe intracranial hemorrhage or death. And it's further divided into those who received antenatal steroids, no antenatal steroids, and then the adjusted odds ratios. You don't need to see them in any great detail. But what it says, you is, says to you is that infants born at lower gestations seem to benefit the most from exposure to antenatal steroids, which was new. We had thought that those who were born earlier didn't necessarily need a benefit as much as those who were in the bigger gestations or, or higher gestations. There was lower mortality and survival with a, a major uh, hospital disability amongst those who received antenatal steroids. And, and that was across other morbidities as well, such as necrotizing enterocolitis, severe retinopathy of prematurity, and BPD, or death. It all showed that those who received antenatal steroids had much better outcomes compared to those. And you can look at the odds, at least see the odds ratios, and all the odds ratios are significant, especially at the lower end of the gestation compared to the higher end of the gestation spectrum. So just in summary, there was a reduction in death by 30% in infants less than 34 weeks. And this was even greater effect when it was less than 25 weeks. There was a reduction in IVH by 45%, a reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis by 50% in the extreme free terms. But the, here's a key point, which is the optimum timing. The optimum timing was defined as when they received it within seven days of birth they completed the course before 24 hours of birth. And this is a crux. Only 22% of the women who were born, uh, uh, who gave birth less than 34 weeks received steroids in this time frame. Now, I would like to come back to this point at, uh, at a later stage about the importance of data. So the other benefits, the benefits of steroids did not exceed seven days. And repeated courses reduced respiratory morbidity, but did not reduce mortality, and in fact may impact fetal growth. So it's important about trying to see how we can, in fact, uh, time the steroids appropriately. Another key intervention uh, that has gained a uh, little bit of recognition in the last few years, uh, at least in the United Kingdom, is magnesium sulfate. We know that the incidence of cerebral palsy increases uh, with the increase with the decreasing gestation. For example, a full-term baby is at risk of developing CP is 0.1% compared to 15% if you're born between 22 and 27 weeks. And the average lifetime cost in the UK is close to 800,000 pounds for a baby with cerebral palsy. And the cost for the individual or the family is unquantifiable. And until recently, we've not had an intervention to prevent CP in preterm babies. But now it appears we have one. So magnesium sulfate actually rapidly crosses the placenta and enters the fetal brain cells. So how does it act when When um, a fetus is exposed to hypoxia, uh, the glutamate levels actually raise to toxic levels. And what the glutamate does is it subsequently binds with an MDA receptors in the brain cells and releases excess calcium, which uh, eventually results in degrading cell membranes and cell death eventually. So magnesium sulfate actually binds with these NMDA receptors and reduces the calcium and flux into the cells and thereby reducing cell death. And this is well demonstrated by the Cochrane review published almost 10, more than 10 years ago, in fact, which had 6,000, more than 6,000 infants. And they showed that it substantially reduced the risk of CP with a relative risk of 0.68. But it's taken several years for people to take note of it and to start using it in routine practice. 
Another interesting study showed that the number needed to treat is 42 to prevent one case of CP. There was a reduction of moderate or severe CP by 37% and severe PCP by 46%. And it is in fact effective even if it was given just four hours prior to delivery. And there was no risk noted to the mother and no risk of respiratory depression to the baby. Now I would like to show you a national picture in the United Kingdom, partly just to bring to people's attention that what we sometimes believe may not necessarily be the case in practice. Now this slide actually shows you the various neonatal networks in our country, one of which I lead, and the one that I lead is the one which has got a star and is in red. So the uptake of magnesium sulfate in 24 hours prior to delivery um, for less than 30 weeks was close to 30, between 30 and 40% 40 in 2016. And that came as a shock to us because we didn't think it was so bad. But in fact, the national average was only less than 50%. But I suspect this was to do a lot with a combination of data entry because we collect, we get a national database that we collect the data from. So it, it is a combination of poor data entry, but also potentially some practice issues. So I undertook a quality improvement exercise um, in our network, which included 20 services. And we formed a frontline um, clinician-led QI program and some similar uh, programs were being run uh, in the country elsewhere and we established a dedicated QI team and strengthened our data collection processes and audit processes and employed people specifically for that and undertook intensive training as well as awareness exercises amongst all the units that you can see on your left. So over an 18 month period, what we were able to do is we were able to demonstrate that we increased our uptake from close to 50% to almost 97%. Although this graph shows you that we are on average 80%. This is because it doesn't take into account those mothers who just delivered uh, soon after uh, coming to the hospital or even for that matter if they delivered outside the hospital. It doesn't take those into account. But we were able to demonstrate a significant improvement by undertaking a quality improvement exercise. We got over 1,400 staff trained to 100% within that 18 month program. So what are the benefits? We potentially prevented about 6.3 cases over an 18 month of cerebral palsy over an 18 month period. And if you took the baseline uh, uh, lifetime cost of 800,000 pounds, that equated about five million pounds saved with an intervention over an 18 month period. And the benefits of the family are unquantifiable and, and therefore I won't go into any great detail there. And it's clearly going to be of great benefit. So just to summarize a little bit about antenatal optimization, when it comes to steroids, it reduces death by 30%. Reduces neck by 50% and reduces severe IVH by 45%. One more baby survives for every 8 to 10 women treated less than 26 weeks. When it comes to magnesium sulfate, it reduces CP by 30% and one fewer baby with CP for every 37 women treated less than 30 weeks. And when it comes to the appropriate place of birth, one more baby survives for every 20 women transferred antenatally to the right place. And I'm not going to talk about um, antibiotics here. So there are other interventions that we can take postnatally, such as optimum cord clamping or optimum cord management, maintaining normal thermia and early maternal breast milk. But subsequently, we can also look at our ventilation strategies, how we administer surfactant, the role of prophylactic hydrocortisone, and possibly the role of probiotics. The British Association of Perinatal Medicine 
advocates that all babies less than 34 weeks gestation have their umbilical cord clamped at least 30 seconds or more after birth, unless there are certain situations where they need to be done immediately. And the aim is simply to improve blood flow and also to reduce any hemodynamic instability. Here's a systematic review and meta-analysis not done not long ago in 2018. Uh, and what it shows over here is, and in fact, it had less than um, 3,000, close to 3,000 babies. And it shows that babies who were born less than 37 weeks preterm, there was a reduction in death by 27% with a number needed to treat between 33 and 35, sorry, 55. And for babies born more preterm, less than 28 weeks, there was a reduction in death by 32% with a number needed to treat of 20. So quite significant. And when it comes to the role of necrotizing enterocolitis, there was a systematic review of six studies that showed there was a reduction in neck significantly. However, the sample sizes were small, so just to be taken with some caution. And what about its effects on other maternal and neonatal outcomes? When it comes to blood pressure, some studies have shown reported higher blood pressures and lesser need for inotropes, uh, lesser need for blood transfusions. Some uh, studies have reported lesser IVH. Although I have showed you a systematic review that just shows that there was um, a reduction in neck. Um, this wasn't necessarily statistically significant in another systematic review, so I think there is some um, um, area of contention still about its role in neck. There was no effect on hypothermia, no, no adverse effects of hypothermia which people are concerned about, especially in the extremely preterm gr group. And it was not associated with any significant difference in terms of risks such as postpartum hemorrhage, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, or for that matter, symptomatic polycythemia. Here is another example of why data is important. Here, it shows um, that um, this is the optimum cord uh, clamping that was reported you know, in, in our region. And you will see that even until uh, early um, last year, that it would, the uptake of optimum cord management is very poor. But since we introduced a quality improvement program uh, just this year, we started to see that rise and now it currently close to 70%. So I think again, it is a combination of poor data entry um, and poor data collection, but also a practice change that occurs and therefore creating better awareness certainly improves the outcome. Normal thermia, again, most of us know that it is important to maintain babies at normal temperatures. Uh, but I'm just highlighting this retrospective observational study because it's a large one that was undertaken by the Canadian Neonatal Network. And the primary outcome they looked for was mortality or severe neurological injury, severe ROP, neck, PPD, and nosocomial infection. And I think this was the first study that actually highlighted the U-shaped curve. And by that, I mean the association of admission temperature with mortality than morbidity. And they showed that you had a higher mortality at the extreme ends of the temp of temperature, for example, at 34 degrees or 39 degrees, and your mortality was least uh, when you have maintained normal temperature. This is a univariate analysis of the same study that looks at the different uh, outcomes and you can see that the outcome between 36 5 to 36 9 and 37 to 37 4 was least um, uh, adverse outcomes compared to the other temperatures and these are all significant statistically so another intervention that shows definite benefit Now I've put down BPD reduction strategies as another intervention. And the reason for doing so is because BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia is the most um, 
significant, uh, I wouldn't say significant, a, a is the most frequent uh, morbidity in amongst the extreme preterm babies and also contributing to the highest mortality in our extreme preterm babies, as well as the one that is linked with adverse neurological outcomes. And there are a number of strategies that you can undertake right from the antenatal period to the later postnatal period. And we will try and touch upon some of these aspects that I have mentioned over here. So this slide talks about delivery room stabilization. And the forest plot here um, has the outcomes of death or BPD. And I've circled the ones that are significant, um, which is the death or BPD and BPD. And there was a significant lesser uh, incidence of death or BPD or BPD when CPAP was administered for babies who were breathing spontaneously in the delivery room. And this systematic review had close to 3,000 3, babies. And what they found was that one additional infant could survive without BPD for every 25 treated with CPAP in the delivery room where appropriate. It is often challenging to administer good quality CPAP in the delivery room if you don't have the right equipment and providing just some CPAP may, and PEEP may not necessarily be sufficient. Uh, but I guess uh, we are sometimes at the mercy of people who have to get this equipment. You may have heard of the benefits of Lisa through the other talks as well, but I thought it was something that is important to highlight. So LISA or less invasive surfactant administration, uh, sorry, apologies for the spelling there. Um, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing LISA with intubation uh, plus surfactant. And close to 900 babies were involved, were like, uh, involved in this uh, meta-analysis. And they looked at the composite outcome of death or BPD and what they found was a significant reduction in death or BPD for amongst the babies who received LISA compared to those who were intubated and subsequently given surfactant. And the benefits were seen across the need for mechanical ventilation within 72 hours or bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 weeks amongst the survivors. And you can see that all was statistically significant with their relative risks, sorry, risk ratios of 0.7. So just to summarize, um, when LISA was compared to invasive ventilation, there were lower odds of death or BPD with an odds ratio of 0.49. There was lower odds of just BPD, and there was lower odds of even severe intraventricular hemorrhage. When LISA was compared with CPAP alone, you had a lower odds of death or BPD, and again, a lower odds of air leak. So again, LISA showed great promise, and it's about trying to implement it. Again, ventilation strategies are very important to prevent BPD because BPD eventually, again, can result not just crit morbidity, but also mortality. So this is a, a Cochrane review that looks at volume targeted ventilation uh, versus pressure limited ventilation. I'm hoping that most people now do not use pressure limited ventilation, but I think again, um, it's, easier said than done. Even in, um, in, the, in, the, in the United Kingdom, there are a number of level one centers who still use pressure limited ventilation. This Cochrane review clearly demonstrates that if you use a, used volume targeted ventilation, you had lesser death or BPD at 36 weeks gestation, which is clearly statistically significant. Another interesting um, piece of information that's come out from this study 
And what it is, it, it, although a retrospective cohort study, sometimes I think we have to rely on retrospective studies to give us more information. And especially if they are large. And, and this study, which had over 3,000 infants that required mechanical ventilation, they looked at the primary outcome of BPD amongst the survivors. And what they were able to do is, if you look at the um, diagram on the right of the screen, uh, you got um, on the um, horizontal axis is the cumulative duration of mechanical ventilation. And on the vertical axis is the probability of developing BPD. And each of those lines represent the number of courses, as in one, two, three, and more than four courses. And what they were able to find was the duration of mechanical ventilation was a much stronger predictor of BPD than the number of courses of ventilation. So the primary aim should be to try and um, extubate the baby, even if it meant that they potentially may need another course of intubation. Sorry, uh, another course of ventilation. And this was the first time that was demonstrated. This is getting a little bit old now. Um, it's almost three years old. Uh, but um, this was a um, review uh, from the Neoprom group. Uh, they undertook a meta-analysis looking at the comparing two saturation targets uh, for the extremely preterm group. And there are a number of studies such as the support study, boost study, and the COT study, and so on. And what they found was the lower saturation target was uh, defined as babies between 85 and 89. Um, and the higher saturation target was defined as 91 to 95. But they did not find any difference in the composite primary outcome of death or major disability between the two groups. So when they did some analysis looking at um, some of the outcomes, what they were able to demonstrate was that there, were, there was more death in the lower saturation target group, which was between 85 to 89. And there was uh, more um, sorry, lesser ROP as well in that group, which meant that the higher saturation target group was beneficial for, uh, when it came to mortality. And therefore, you, since you have to be alive to develop ROP, it would make sense that you actually um, targeted the higher saturation. And so all the centers um, in the United Kingdom now have moved to the higher saturation targets of 80, 91 to 95. Another intervention that has gained uh, more attention in the recent years has been the prophylactic hydrocortisone. Um, this is a double-blinded randomized controlled trial uh, called the Premilox study that came out from France, which um, recruited close to more than 500 babies. They did not reach the target of over 700. Uh, this included babies less than 28 weeks gestation. And they use low dose hydrocortisone for the first 10 days of life, which is one milligram per kilogram twice daily for seven days, followed by 5.5 milligrams once daily for three days. And what they showed was hydrocortisone increased survival without BPD, which is significant, but it also increased late onset sepsis for the 24 to 25 weeks gestational subgroup. Interestingly, there was no difference in GI perforation and there's no difference in, 20, in the two-year neurodevelopmental outcomes overall, but in fact, improve the neurodevelopmental outcomes in the 24 to 25 weeks and group. A Cochrane review uh, also concluded that early hydrocortisone reduced the combined outcome of death or BPD, uh, which was significant without an increase in cerebral palsy. So it felt relatively safe. Another individual a patient data meta-analysis, which is said to be of the highest quality of uh, evidence, um, were able to uh, look at five RCTs, but only four were included because they were unable to get the individual patient data for one of the studies. And this showed that early hydrocortisone significantly increased survival without BPD 
and reduce death before discharge. However, there was an increased risk of GI perforations when it was given along with indomethacin. So it's something that needs to be taken note of. And also increased uh, late onset sepsis. When you looked at two-year neurodevelopmental outcomes, there was no significant difference. But in fact, the direction of there was, there was a direction of benefit for neurodevelopmental impairment in the hydrocortisone group. So again, reassuring. I'm touching on dexamethasone not necessarily because it is about specifically optimizing it, but often it's been used as treatment. But it may be something that we need to consider about using it as, as an optimization um, method. So dexamethasone reduces death with or without BPD without an increase in cerebral palsy based on how you use it. So in the past, there was a concern that use of dexamethasone increased the incidence of CP and therefore people stopped using dexamethasone. But when you looked at it very closely, it was when you used a higher doses or used it very early on. So optimum timing and dosing are important, but how our regimes are not very clear at this point. But you can actually use individualized risk versus benefit. So if there is a risk of greater, if there's a risk of more than 50% chance of developing BPD, then use of dexamethasone actually um, trumps the risks because you have lesser death or uh, CP. And that's that shown in this picture there. I, we undertook um, a um, national survey uh, with the British Pediatric Surveillance Unit um, where we defined life-threatening BPD as babies who were actually on respiratory support at 38 weeks gestation because this group has never been looked at. And we found that close to 40% of the infants with life-threatening BPD had never received steroids. So one could argue that we actually didn't optimize these babies and had we actually tried to give them steroids earlier, they might have been in a better place. With regards to the recommendations, you have the National Institute of Clinical Excellence uh, in the UK recommending the use of dexamethasone after eight days. Um, the European consensus statement um, uh, recommends use of dexamethasone within one to two weeks, and the Canadian group recommend um, use of um, dexamethasone after the first week of life. Uh, but this is usually in a situation where the baby's all requiring ventilation after a week of life and the doses vary. In my unit, we use a dose called um, of only 50 micrograms uh, per kilo, which is a very low dose and therefore concern, the concerns of the risks are much lower. But whether it is the optimum dose is a completely different question. I'd just like to highlight to you again the importance of evidence-based practices. Um, this is a study that comes out from the APIS cohort uh, with over 7,000 infants born. And what they looked at is they defined uh, evidence-based practice as if a baby was delivered in a maternity unit of the appropriate level of care when they received antenatal steroids and there was prevention of hypothermia as well as surfactant used within the first two hours of life or early CPAP. And in the table, what you can see is the variables uh, and amongst the babies who received uh, evidence-based care and those who did not receive evidence-based care and the adjusted risk ratios. And when you look at the adjusted risk ratios for mortality and severe morbidity, they are in favor, clearly in favor of those who received evidence-based care uh, with significantly lower adjusted risk ratios. So simple interventions sometimes make a big difference. I think almost all of us know the importance of early breast milk. It's got several advantages, such as immunological advantages, anti-inflammatory, gastrointestinal advantages, nutritional benefits, neurological benefits, long-term health outcomes associated with good long-term health outcomes. 
But I just want to just touch on each of those just briefly to show you where the benefits lie. There was reduce, it reduces the risk of CP. It reduces the risk of ROP significantly. It reduces the risk of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. When it comes to gastrointestinal benefits, it reduces the risk of neck. And one study showed that when extremely low birth weight babies receive less than half their intake of uh, as expressed breast milk or some breast milk in the first 10 days of life, it adds a hazards ratio of 1.6 for infection, neck or death. Neurologically, they've got better brain growth has been shown, better developmental outcomes, and it has been associated with better long-term outcomes such as lower risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. And also, all this put together obviously has uh, benefits in terms of health economics. So what we're trying to do is to try and introduce colostrum as early as possible. In fact, if possible, within the first two hours of life in an undertaking quality improvement programs to, to introduce that. So probiotics, I had put that in bracket earlier on. And the reason for that is, you know, this is a position statement that comes out uh, from Espagan. Uh, we looked at more than 15,000 preterms that part, have participated so far in various art cities. And this suggests a reduction or in neck, sepsis, and mortality. However, there are many unanswered questions in regards to the strain, the dosage, and how long to supplement. Interestingly, recent network meta-analysis actually showed the efficacy in reducing mortality and morbidity was only found in a minority of these studied strains and combinations. So Espagan has come out with a conditional recommendation, which is of low certainty of evidence, uh, is to provide either Lactobacillus rhamnosus or Bifidobacterium species in order to reduce necrotizing and procolitis rates. And in general, we tend to uh, start uh, probiotics when you're at least 0.5 ml per kilo per hour you know, when you've got milk going and up to 34 weeks. So I'm just coming towards my the end and, and one of the things that I wanted to highlight was the principle of doing these things. And this is the butterfly effect and the butterfly effect is about how small changes um, in a complex system can bring about results that are virtually impossible to predict. And I would argue even this webinar series is one such thing where it actually can bring about significant changes that we can't actually predict. And another theory that I believe in is a theory of marginal gains, uh, which Sir David um, Braceford, who was actually a, a cycling coach he used this theory of marginal gains, or he in fact introduced it, which is about 1% effect. At the time he took over the British cycling, uh, uh, it was an ailing uh, cycling team, uh, which had actually achieved only two bronze medals. And by the time the London uh, Olympics happened in 2012, he was able to get them eight golds, two silvers and two bronze. And he believed in the concept of 1% effects, small effects in multiple areas will bring about a big change. Uh, and in fact, that little cartoon that you've got on the side just shows you that, that each day you make a change, by the time, by the end of the year, you have a 37% difference in terms of effect. I'd also want to stress a few points um, about the importance of trying to bridge uh, the gap between evidence and practice. And over the last recent years, I have started to focus more on, on trying to bridge this gap because there is a lot of evidence that is out there and we believe that we are practicing it, but are we really practicing it? So, and that's where I stress about the importance of collecting data. And when we've actually started to collect data and found that actually it, 
it may not necessarily be the case it may not necessarily be true uh, in what you believe and by having a good data uh, as your benchmarking or as your baseline then you can you can introduce quality improvement exercises and then measure your outcomes at the end of it so how to make this happen i think there are several factors um, that influence uh, that will influence change you you need the right environment or you need to set you need to change the environment you need to get all people on board with you there needs to be system changes and also change in processes and definitely education and all put together uh, we can bring about change for the benefit of the babies thank you let me just thank you, very much. Thank you so uh, so much uh, Pro professor sandeep you had actually uh, summarized the whole concept of preterm care so nicely that it is uh, feasible for uh, not only in the resource uh, rich settings even in the resource limited settings now before we go on to discuss uh, discussion may I invite all of you for the international neonatology summit that we are planning to host um, in uh, kerala so this is a event uh, that is going to be that is going to un unfold in the uh, on in the month of march Thank you. Now we'll go on to the discussion on optimization of uh, preterm uh, uh, management. Now to moderate the discussion, we have uh, two leading neonatologists from India, Dr. Ravi Shankar from Hyderabad. Welcome, sir. And Dr. Mamta Jaju from New Delhi, India. Welcome, madam. Over to you. Kindly take over the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Man Manoj. And uh, thank you to Sandeep, Professor Sandeep, for an excellent and amazing talk. 
I think uh, you have summarized the whole preterm care in such a beautiful way and in a, such a simplistic way that uh, it's really amazing. So the taking out the small, small points and uh, uh, showing the importance of each small practices, the evidence-based practices, that is really very nice. So I'll go to the question answer session and I'll start with the first question. Uh, it's asked by the Dr. Bahari. So he's asking that, do you think the benefit of LISA is that in centers where prophylactic surfactant policy is still pursued, will prevent unnecessary intubation and use of morphine? Uh, so over to you, uh, Professor Sandeep. Yeah. So I, I can tell you what we do in our, in, in our center and what most other studies have suggested that we do. So LISA is I sometimes practiced in the delivery room itself and in many centers practiced once a baby is admitted to the neonatal unit. So often when they are on CPAP and they look for an oxygen requirement of say 30% and once the baby reaches that oxygen requirement, that is when LISA is effectively practiced. Now, it's usually given for babies less than 32 weeks because um, the evidence is about reducing uh, uh, BPD and therefore you, you'll be concerned about BPD only in babies less than 32 weeks gestation. So practices slightly vary, but you usually practice only once the baby has reached a 30% oxygen on CPAP. And with whether it reduces the need for morphine, you often give morphine or fentanyl, depending upon some people give fentanyl. Um, sometimes you don't, uh, but I think it is useful to sedate the baby a little bit before giving, um, before administering um, Lisa catheter itself. Um, it certainly has its benefits, whether it, with regards to morphine, if, it, if, if you are going to ventilate a baby, you're going to give morphine as a result of which, you know, you're going to leave the baby on, for longer periods of morphine. Yes, it will reduce that. I don't know if I've answered the question, um, as a person had expected i think uh yeah you uh, you have but uh, he, he might he want to ask basically the delivery room practices so uh, probably that the surfactant uh, should be given during the in the labor room itself is uh, through the lisa if it is indicated so is it uh, right or yeah I, I, I see no reason why not to, why not, why it can't be given. And I have had these discussions before about if, if it is, if um, I think it's about trying to find a balance between some of them who may not need it. And therefore, and I think that is why we say, shall we wait till the baby is needing 30% oxygen on CPAP? You might even potentially get away with that intervention of Lisa because LISA itself is an intervention where you have to laryngoscope the baby and put a catheter and potentially even in some cases sedate the baby and give atropine. Uh, so it is not without its uh, issues. And I think it's trying to find the right balance where in some cases, some people believe that they will give it in delivery room and others wait till you reach an oxygen requirement of 30%. Right. Thank you. So over to you, Dr. Ravi Shankar. So please unmute yourself. Yeah. It was a wonderful talk, Professor Sandeep. Uh, it was nice to, the, your last slide of you know, marginal gains were very, very impressive. It just show, shows the way forward in our uh, practice. Uh, I was interested to know about one thing about uh, very low dose. You told there is a very low dose dexamethasone. So what's the evidence for that? You know, you, there is one thing which is standardized now is a DART, but you also use a very low dose. So what's that and what is the dose of it? And uh... So there is no evidence. <laughs> Uh, so this is purely anecdotal, and it is probably one of the very few centers that practice it, and I, I come from that center. So we use a dose of 50 micrograms once daily of dexamethasone. And what we have found is that, and again, this is anecdotal, that we have been able to extubate babies on that dose, and we tend to leave them on a prolonged uh, course as opposed to a DART regime where you start and you finish within the first 10 days or, or so. And the reason for that was more because initially there were concerns around the uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes in cerebral palsy in dexamethasone. So about 15 years ago, uh, that's when we started to introduce it. We were one of the first few centers that we did it, I think 
anywhere in the world. And then a Minitex trial was started. I don't know, you may have heard of the Minitex trial, which was basically to try and look at the uh, dosage of 50 micrograms. Uh, but I think because of, um, I think there wasn't enough equipoise um, so although with the start trial started, it, it had to be stopped because there weren't enough people uh, who were willing to, uh, uh, to try the new, newer regime. They were still reverting back to the DART regime itself. So like I said, there isn't any evidence, but uh, we've found it to be of, uh, of benefit. Uh, what I would advocate is that if you have a baby who is stuck on a ventilator for a period, long period of time, not, not initially, not at the initial extubation period, but much longer. I think trying them on low dose uh, uh, dexamethasone is certainly worthwhile. As to whether you want to use the same dose in your first extubation, your initial extubation within the, say, so if a baby is ventilated after a first week of life, I think that's a slightly different question because there isn't any, there is a, you've got evidence for other uh, treatment strategies, whereas you don't have one for the uh, low dose one. Nice. I, think, I wish uh, we have some more, uh, because we just had a case in our hospital where in the, just, you know, after the first dose, the child had a massive GI bleed. And uh, when we started uh, the baby on uh, DART, so we were you know, literally, you know, worried, are we exceeding, what is the dose which is, you know, appropriate for any baby? Is still not clear, especially when we have such kind of you know problems. Yeah. That is that is that, that is true. I'll take next two questions. I'll just pose it to you and then ask uh, Madam Pamta to take the next two. There is one more quick question from uh, Dr. Bahari, who asks, "What do you think of the court trial when it comes to oxygen targets?" So this uh, he is asking about uh, what is uh, what's your take on the court trial that uh, 85 to 89 versus 90 to 95? Yeah. Yes. So I think that was the, the Neoprom um, uh, collaboration meta analysis I showed. And then within that, you have the court trial, you have boost trial, and you have one more trial. So almost five trials put together that they showed. And like I'd showed over there, what they found was that there was. Although there was no difference between the uh, combined outcome of mortality and uh, and uh, BPD, in that what they did they did show was that there was an increased risk of BP uh, of uh, so there was a decreased death in the high saturation group, which was 91 to 95. Uh, there was decreased neck in that group, although there was an increased um, ROP. But I guess you have to be alive to develop ROP. And therefore, you know, we have all moved towards actually using the higher saturation targets, which is uh, 91 to 95 for the extreme preterm babies. Uh, and I think the court trial effectively says that. Thank you. Uh, there's one more uh, question by Dr. Gautami, uh, uh, who's asking what about the fluids? Uh, because uh, how liberal or restrictive should we uh, in when giving the fluids to the preterm babies and how does it influence their outcomes? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and because um, often, you know, the fluid regimes are sometimes um, uh, blamed for outcomes, especially BPD and, you know, PDAs and so on, isn't it? So there is some work that's been done about low fluid regimes and high fluid regimes. Um, and if you have lower fluid regimes, then you have lesser BPD, okay? But having said that, it depends on how you define your lower fluid regimes. So up to 100 mils per kilo per day uh, in the first day of life is still considered to be lower fluid regime for preterm baby in this, in the, in this particular trial that has showed the difference. So to some extent, it depends upon what you use on your unit. And on average, what I have found is people use anywhere between 80 to 100 mils per kilo per day in the first day of life in the extreme preterm babies. Uh, and they are all considered to be low flu regimes. Yeah. 
That's fine. I think I think what is important is we have to you know optimize. Uh, we have we have to carefully monitor them. Uh, we might start with around 80 to 100 or 1 to 20, but uh, slightly on the lower side is slightly better, better yeah. off. Yeah. You're right, because you have to keep an eye on their sodiums. You need to make sure that they don't dry out as well. Uh, and you need to keep an eye on their nutrition as well. So it, it is a fairly complex uh, matter, not something that you can simply decide on one or the other. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, that's in interesting and a big topic to cover upon the TPN and the fluid and electrolytes in this. Uh, but it's very important to be a more restrictive than a, to be on the more liberal side. So the next question uh, is uh, like the, Dr. Obed, he's saying that thank you for the excellent talk. But he wants to ask about the nurse uh, to monitor the brain regional oxygenation and reduce FiO2 the use of this NIRS and any evidence for accepting lower oxygen saturation if brain regional saturation is maintained within the acceptable range? Yes, um, again, um, we haven't, uh, this, it was many years ago, several years ago that I was interested in, you know, in, in NERS and in, in its benefits. We haven't actually uh, taken it up as much. So we, in, in my unit, it'll be don't unit, we don't use it. My pediatric intensive care unit, yes, they use, um, nurse, especially the cardiology center uses nurse. Now, I think we are not at a point where we can actually rely purely on nurse and then accept lower saturations itself. I don't think we've, we've reached, we've reached that point yet. I think the jury is still out and more work needs to be done with regards to whether we can rely on nurse as a tool, but it, I think it is an additional tool, but not a, a, a single tool that we can rely on. Right. Okay. So the next, next again, one question I'm taking is the use of antenatal steroids lead to reduction in BPD consistently. Does use of antenatal steroids lead to reduction in BPD consistently? St systematic reviews don't support that. So don't, it is asked by Dr. Anut Thakur from New Delhi. Well, I've actually, I think, showed you a, a, um, the systematic review didn't show, but there was a very large uh, uh, cohort study of over a thousand ba uh, babies from 32, almost from 23 weeks to 34 weeks that showed a significant reduction where antenatal steroids, where they compared the use of antenatal steroids uh, in mums and those who did not receive antenatal steroids, and they showed a significant reduction uh, in that. I recognize that, you know, it hasn't, uh, shown it in the systematic review. Uh, but I think this is such a large, large uh, study that we can't ignore. And, and therefore, I think, you know, it is something that, you know, we have to take into account. You know? yeah. So uh, in the, the, uh, I just want to ask uh, regarding the antenatal steroids. So we all know that there are so many evidence based good effect, good benefits of antenatal steroids when we are using it. But still, when we see the uses, it's very less. So uh, uh, there are a very lot of restrictions from obstetrician side not to use antenatal steroids. They are worrying about the hyperglycemia or sometimes uh, gestational diabetes may flare up or the sepsis may flare up. So uh, do you have any experience like how to increase by the quality improvement processes to improve the, uh, the uses of antenatal steroids? Yes, I, I think that's a very good question because it's often these kind of things that I've said are, are, are about minimal gains. It's about these small interventions which are which we believe is happening is not happening, and we lose out on it. Uh, and very similar, I think we I've had faced similar problem, uh, not problems, similar issues where they said, "Oh, I'm concerned about the mother's diabetes. I'm concerned about her blood sugars, and therefore we don't want to give it." But with constant dialogue and asking for clear evidence, I think. There is the Royal College of Obstetrics have actually given out some clear, clear, clear evidence about who should receive steroids and who shouldn't receive steroids. Um, and we've also undertaken um, quality improvement projects in terms of collecting data. So if you went to your hospital and looked back at all the women, how, what proportion of them who delivered preterm received steroids? And you would be actually surprised to find that there'll be a significant number of women who haven't received steroids despite the fact that they didn't have clear-cut contraindications. 
So the first step would be to try and work on that group uh, and also to work with the obstetric colleagues in terms of saying, we need to have clear cut uh, contraindications. Another example I can give you is about um, the magnesium sulfate. So when we started about uh, to introduce magnesium sulfate, we had a lot of obstetricians in my region who would say, we can't give magnesium sulfate for various uh, reasons um, that they may come up with, you know, they say this is a contraindication. And then we look back at the evidence and show that actually there is no evidence for you not to do it. They may say, if the mom has an infection, we don't want to give it. And we looked at it. And we were able to then write a guideline up and people then subsequently followed it. And what I found was, was because people are often a little bit worried about taking an individual decision. But when you had a clear guideline, they were willing to follow the guideline because it was a consensus. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what do you, Dr. Vishankar? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, there are some questions about um, magnesium sulfate. There's one interesting question. Uh, uh, says that why don't we give the magnesium to the baby itself? So why not, uh, why is it not given? Because does it actually, uh, you are talking about, uh, does it have a neuroprotective effect for the babies after birth? If we give it, especially well, for those, I don't know whether this question is really you know, relevant to your talk because he talks about term gestation also. Yeah, but still you could uh, talk about it. Yeah. I, I think I, I can see where the question's coming from in terms of saying if, you know, if magnesium is thought, uh, if the mechanism of um, neurodevelopmental impairment is because of high, high uh, glutamate levels because of fetal hypoxia, then that results in increased calcium influx into the cells and results in cell death. Why couldn't we do the same in terms of a preterm baby? Now, the issue there you, you have is the baby is, is exposed to the hypoxia. The, the, uh, the cascade effect has already happened and the baby is subsequently born and the cell death or cell lysis has already occurred. Whereas in what happens in um, the uh, antenatal magnesium sulfate is the magnesium is already waiting there. It's taken, it's gone and bound with the NMDA receptors preventing calcium from getting it uh, into the cells, whereas in this case, it will be postnatal and therefore the effect is unlikely to be as much. Now, having said that, there aren't any proposals for any trials to take place, but I would not be surprised if this comes up in the future for in the cases of HIE as to whether we should, it would be one of those adjunct therapies along with choline. Uh, one one uh, doctor well, Anupi is actually asking for evidence for the delivery rooms PPAP in decreasing the PPD. Uh, he's saying that your uh, forest plot uh, shows that it is actually not showing that much of evidence. So do we have real hard evidence to say that uh, delivery rooms PPAP uh, decreases the instance of the BPD? The, I, I think what I showed was that the, um, I can bring this slide up for you if you want to, but I think what it basically showed was a, the, um, it did show a, a, a reduction of, uh, of BPD when, uh, when uh, CPAP was introduced early on in the delivery room. Uh, I'm not sure if he looked at the, uh, uh, at the right uh, thing, but, Yeah, so it did. It, yeah, it does show a reduction in um, in BPD when used in delivery rooms. Yeah, uh, Doctor Akila from Hyderabad is asking, uh, what is the evidence of uh, using the budesonide along with superfactant? Because I think there's a lot of um, uh, work going on in adding a steroid to this perfecting to decrease the incidence of BPD. So your take on that. Yeah. 
I have heard I've, I've heard of that, but I think the use of budesonide is actually there has been some concerns around the use of budesonide because there was one trial that shows that there was worse neurodevelopmental outcomes uh, after the use of budesonide. Um, I can't recall the exact things, but I think there was although there were some benefits that were clear benefits that were there in, came, in terms of BPD, there was worse neurodevelopmental outcomes. Uh, I haven't heard. Is this question specific to at the time of soon after birth, along with surfactant? Yes. I yeah. haven't heard of that. With surfactant. Yeah. With surfactant. Okay. So I I I know that butyrosinide used otherwise has got worse neurodevelopmental outcomes, but it, it's not something that we practice here in the United Kingdom. Doctor. Mamta, madam, you can just yes, yes, ask sir. your question. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so, Dr. Kanchana, she's asking that up to what period is it recommended to start magnesium sulfate? And do you recommend starting labor room CPAP to spontaneously breathing babies, especially between the 32 to 34 weeks? Yeah. So, with regards to magnesium sulfate, magnesium sulfate has been shown to have benefit for women less than 32 weeks gestation clear benefit. It is even more beneficial if it's given for less than 30 weeks gestation. Um, so I think where a woman is about to deliver and you know you have at least 24 hours before that, I think that's when you, you consider giving magnesium sulfate. The side effects for magnesium sulfate are, I am told, uh, that women feel very flushed and sometimes very hot. Uh, it's, it's more those kind of side effects, but otherwise there's nothing else that's of any uh, significance for the baby. With regards to your second question about delivery room CPAP, it is it's a challenge, but we are all trying to do that. In many of the European countries, especially the Scandinavian countries who do a lot better, who have much, much lower rates of BPD, they introduce a delivery room CPAP. They've got the equipment and they, it's not like I'd said in the, my talk, it's not about just providing some PEEP, but actually they have CPAP machines that are put in place right in the delivery room itself. They, and therefore their ventilation rates are very minimal, very, very low ventilation rates compared to many of the other units. So yes, babies between 32 and 34 weeks, if you find that they need some sort of respiratory support, it, I don't think you should use it routinely. If you believe that they need respiratory support or they're needing very high oxygen, they're working hard, I think you can by all means you know, try CPAP. Yeah, and I think this is a routine recommendation now as per the NRP guidelines also to have PP stresis detector and you give the minimal PEEP if required in the delivery room only. And even in India also, uh, people are following that and most of the centers, they are having now TPs in the labor room only. So it's very important to give a minimal PEEP if required in the Absolutely. So in fact, we go up to PEEPs of five and you know sometimes even six uh, and what uh, what happens is the difficulty is you're trying to hold the mask on the face while you are talking, while you're moving the baby across, you know, 100 meters or 200 meters. And often you will find that that peep, you lose the peep. Yes. And sometimes people take the mask off the face of the baby to show the baby to the parents. Yes. And what you have lost then again is you've lost the positive pressure during that time. So we we put some extra quality improvements in where we don't take the mask off the face at all. Okay. Yeah, even to show the parents, they can take a picture, but you know, we'll put the CPAP, proper CPAP on. Mm -hmm. So the next question is from uh, the liver and he said that it's an excellent presentation, but want to ask that what other things can we do to improve care for preterm infants, apart from everything that has been said. We know that the best strategy is prevention, but there is no marker or test to anticipate a premature birth. So I think the with best practices, I think quality improvement is very, very important. So like you said, every point you are saying that to apply the QIs in your, and over to you again then. Yes, I think um, it's about trying to, to prevent uh, labor, isn't it? And in, in, in time it. So for example, here, what we're using is the value of 
the obstetricians, for example, they look at the cervical length, look at fibronectin levels, and then based on that, decide about when is the optimum time to transfer a woman to a closer, to a center who can look after these babies. So those are the kind of optimizations that you need to do. But unfortunately, we can't prevent preterm labor itself. We can't prevent preterm birth. That has to be a much more... Um, uh, it's about improving the quality, the health of the uh, mother. It has to it, 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 it talks. It's about smoking. It's about other other things that need to uh, need to be taken into account. But things that we can do is to try and uh, make sure that they're in the right place and we give them the right treatment. Right. Yeah. But it's very difficult to do such type of things, especially in the India and small places where the. The tertiary centers, are. but still there are a lot of programs going on, and every center is now now with getting equipped with SNCUs to improve these cares. So the next question I am I'm taking Dr. Ravi Shankar because it interests me also very much because in our unit we are also with a lot of BPTs. So the, he, Mr. Pankaj Kumar is asking that BPD by definition, what if any is the role of furosemide? And what should be the regime if it is at all having significant role? Please guide. Okay. So we don't use furosemide. We use we used to use clothiazide and spironolactone. Uh, but having said that, we have moved away from the use of diuretics completely for the for BPD. There may be the odd case where you might find that the baby is needing a lot of respiratory support or is in high oxygen, and therefore you 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 want to try and do something temporarily to try and reduce it. And I have used um, diuretics in that situation. Uh, but I think diuretics do have a lot of adverse effects as well, um, like the effects on growth, the effect on uh, electrolyte imbalance, uh, on um, bone disease, and so on. So we have moved away from using diuretics completely um, from uh, in uh, for BPD. And in fact, I think I would probably say less than 5% of our babies or 10% of our babies would, start, would be receiving BPD diuretics now so give us some ideas that how to go about the bpd especially the when babies are requiring low oxygen even after 36 37 38 weeks of gestation and we were not able to discharge them still they are on full feeds gaining weight but they require minimal oxygen so so yeah so let me give you an example of what happens here so we have babies for example who are in oxygen let's say the extreme preterm babies 23 24 weekers 25 weekers even up to 28 weekers so they become they come to 37 weeks and they're ready to go home and they need oxygen what we do is we discharge them home on oxygen okay and then they take about three to four months and they get uh, and then they just they come off oxygen completely Mm -hmm. Very rarely do we find a baby who needs oxygen for longer than six months. Mm -hmm. But I think that's because of the setup we are in, we are able to actually get, get them, uh, send them home on oxygen. Mm -hmm. I think those are the kind of things that, you know, people need to think about in the future. Because the more and better you get with the preterm care, yes. and you start to resuscitate much uh, younger babies, mm -hmm. you will be bound to have babies who are getting discharged home on oxygen and you can't keep them forever in the hospital. And therefore there needs to be a system in place or somebody starting to look at saying, oh, this is an area where we can actually develop. We could actually be discharging babies home on oxygen. We need to set up a service yes. for home oxygen. Right. Thank you. That's, that's, right. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, we have also sent uh, many of our uh, babies on uh, home oxygen and one of them actually required oxygen for a year and that mm -hmm. child is actually doing well. Uh, there are so many questions on ICU care but I'd like to ask one important thing you have shown very nicely shown that the outcomes of the babies is related to the temperature at the time of admission and at the time of birth. So both lower temperatures and higher temperatures are not good for them. So what is your practice? Uh, what are your practices? How do you, because we know everything. So how do you do in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, in your, you know, hospital, uh, how do you manage the temperature of such uh, kind of, you know. Uh, so we do a couple of things. I mean, there are lots of things, isn't it? So for example, in, 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 in the UK, it's about being more cold. 
So, and therefore we have to ensure that, you know, you, we keep the places warm. So if you come, to, if, you, if the baby is born in, uh, in a theater, we need to make sure that the theaters are not cold because often the air conditioners are on over there and it's very cold. So we go and make sure that the temperature is uh, brought to a normal temperature, a room temperature. The resuscitators are, also have under um, uh, heaters, so we keep the temperatures about 38 or so for the mattress heaters, and the overhead heaters are, you know, started before the baby is born, so it's kept nice and warm. And then subsequently, the babies are placed in a plastic bag. Now we have something called the Neo Help bags, which are more uh, like with a Velcro in the front, so you get to put the baby in and then close the baby straight away. And that can be done right at the, as soon as the baby is delivered, okay. very close to the mother. In the neck or this? Up to the neck and over the head as well. Oh. So there's a hood as well. So you can do, you, you we can do that. We just take, so that in fact, the obstetrician puts it straight in there because we do practice delayed cord clamping. So we were worried about hypothermia. So they put the bag in straight away and hold the baby there for a minute and then transfer. And once th that happens, we transfer the baby, uh, obviously, with making sure that, you know, your sides of your cots are up because of convection, preventing convection uh, uh, loss, and the incubators are already and on for us. So those are the kind of things that we try and do to maintain temperature. It uh, must be honest that it is a challenge here as well. Um, uh, it's, not always, uh, it's not always so straightforward. Sometimes we do have uh, babies outside the normal temperature, but more often in the lower end of the temperature rather than high end. See, at times, you know, uh, we just, you know, run out of the incubators. So, what would, so how do you manage uh, a small baby under a radiant form? You know, especially, how do you maintain? Do you use some kind of tents or something like that? Or well, Fortunately, we don't have a problem with the incubators itself. I think we, we managed to have enough incubators. I think what we tend to do is we, kept, we leave them in the plastic bags. I don't know if you leave them in the plastic bags, but uh, what we tend to do is once the baby is brought, and even if the baby is put in the incubator, we leave them in the plastic bags uh, for at least a few hours till the incubator temperature is, you know, is, is reached the proper level itself. Unless the baby is becoming hyperthermic, we will leave them in the plastic bags. So those are kind of small things do make a difference. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have the issue that I think you face. Yeah, that's right. There's one interesting question about, um, because one of the, uh, one of the doctor is asking about, as uh, amniotic fluid is important for growth and the development of the lungs, so is there any role of using amniotic fluid for preventing BPD? I, I just found this very interesting. <laughs> I don't know whether there's some kind of work on this. I, I haven't heard of any work <laughs> around the use of amniotic fluid, but it is an interesting thing. When, from from what, the reason I, I say interesting is uh, because it, it is part of the, of the fetus itself, isn't it? And therefore, that's one of the things that the fetus doesn't have contact with anymore after birth and what the role of amniotic fluid has after that. I, I haven't, to be honest, looked at it in any depth. There's one interesting question by Dr. Paneer Selvan. He's asking about how do you shift the babies from the delivery room to the NICU while they are being given the CPAP? So he's asking whether there is any role of using the argyle prongs to give the NCPAP or do you fit them with the face mask itself? Yeah, we currently do that with the face mask. And I think that's one of the things that I have been battling with for some time in terms of trying to get CPAP machines installed on our resuscitors. Because what I have found is that however hard you try to administer adequate CPAP or PEEP for that matter, um, by the time you walk a baby down three, four minutes uh, from the delivery room into the neonatal unit, and then subsequently move the baby from the resuscitor into the um, into that incubator, you've lost PEEP. And we know these babies are surfactant deficient and their, their alveoli will collapse like a balloon very quickly, you know, if you don't have that PEEP. So we, we are trying to get 
uh, some more um, um, CPAP machines that can actually go on to the resuscitator, and there are plenty that are available. Uh, the, the problems we face over here are, uh, is more to do with the fact about resources in terms of having to make a business case to your hospital and, uh, and then they have to approve it. Uh, and we, we face those kind of problems. Dr. Mamta, you would like to take some you know, questions? Yeah, so there are a few questions regarding hydrocortisone and the low dose, the DART therapy. Uh, so I think people want clarification regarding that. The one thing you said is the very low dose of uh, uh, steroids in preventing BPD. So uh, can you again give to... Yeah, I, I can say that. Yeah, I can say that. So the very low dose steroid or dexamethasone, this is dexamethasone we're talking about, uh, is um, the 50 micrograms per kilo. There is no duration. That is because there isn't a study that has been done to say that you should use it for 10 days or five days or two weeks. What I can tell you is my practice. So when I have a baby who is on the ventilator, say for 10 days, 14 days, and I think I need to start to give some uh, steroids, I might start the baby on 50 micrograms per kilogram per day, once daily. Uh, and then leave it in. Often what I find is that within the next 48 to 72 hours, 72 hours, the baby starts to get much better. The oxygen requirement comes down dramatically and within the next day or so is ready to be extubated. I continue the same dose until the baby is extubated for a few more days and then start dropping the dose little by little, maybe from 50 to 45 per kilo then 45 to 40. 40 per kilo over the next few days. So every two to three days, every three days or twice a week, we keep dropping the dose down and eventually take the baby off that. Sometimes you might find that there are some babies who become steroid dependent and where we need to carry on for a period of time. So often you might have a baby on low dose dexamethasone or something like 30 per kilo for at least two to three weeks. Um, and that is to try and keep their oxygen levels down. And, and so it, it has helped. But like I said, I can't back that up with any evidence uh, because there are no trials. So in BPD, what uh, so optimum oxygen levels, which you suggest is 91 to 95 or a little lower? So we use 91 to 90. The, 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 all the studies that have showed so far would advocate use of targeting between 91 to 95. So even in BPD also, we need to keep. In this yeah. All preterm babies uh, between 91 to 95. So we change our target once they hit term. So about 36 weeks gestation, we change our we change the target to above 95. But until then, they are less. Mm -hmm. What targets do you use there? We are also using the same targets, but sometimes the like the BPD and the prolonged oxygen therapy, uh, mm -hmm. like 90 to 91. So it's between 90. We try to decrease the oxygen as much as possible. So that's why, like with Blender also or with Flow, try to keep it as. Uh, so the uh, Dr. Ginny, she is asking that any role of magnesium sulfate in near term and preterm uh, babies with anticipated perinatal de depression. I think I might have just answered that question earlier on in terms of saying that you know we we uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been done anywhere. There hasn't been any work that has been done so far. But I think the reason for that is because in, in that case, the damage has already been done. Uh, whereas in preterm births, we're doing it antenatally before the damage is done. So is there any role of mesenchymal stem cell therapy for reducing BPD? Dr. Sunil from Hyderabad is asking. Yes, I looked up, I looked at this a few years ago, I must say, and there was some work about actually stem cell transplant and BPD, and it was promising work. Now, I looked at it about five years ago, and then there was supposed to be a, a phase two study of that, and nothing has come out since then that I am aware of. So I don't know if that has not happened because there wasn't any, any further progress, but what it showed was there was a reduction in BPD in a very small group in, in that very small uh, study that was done and it was supposed to be, it was shown to be promising. Okay, yes. So Dr. Vishankar? We have uh, so many 
questions on the management of a premature baby in the NICU, and this can go on for a long time. I'll just take one more question uh, about uh, what is the role of perfectant in the established BPD? There are a lot of questions on this one. BPD, they're asking whether it can be give if they have a low lung volumes and uh, something like an HMD picture after 28 days. So do you give this as one of your methods of you know, management of uh, BPD? I think I can say fairly categorically that there is no role for surfactant uh, later on. There was a very good trial called the Toll Surf trial, I think, that was done a few years ago, and where they actually showed that use of surfactant later did not have any benefit. I think the only thing they showed amongst all the outcomes was that probably a group of babies who received later surfactant had lesser um, uh, home oxygen need. Now, I think that was just in an incidental finding uh, itself, but I don't think there was any other benefits for um, uh, later steroids. I hope I've answered that question. So I think I think we have almost uh, had more than uh, half an hour of this kind of you know discussion, and the questions are still there about uh, the management of the babies in the NICU. I know that it is an ever-ending thing. Uh, can you just summarize, like in the sense that you know, uh, what would be the best practices in the delivery room? Let's say for uh, a practitioner, just. A few words about how, I mean, how practically speaking, what should be the best best practices, uh, evidence based, which should be practiced and in the delivery room for a premature okay. delivery. Yeah, I think I will I'll probably start with actually saying that maybe one way to look at it is slightly differently and have run simulation sessions. So what you need to be able to do is to be able to understand how each one of us practice so is to try and have a preterm baby as a, as a and run a simulation session and say what are the things we want to be doing for example and um, i will give you an example of what we do uh, if there was a baby who was born at 26 weeks gestation or 28 weeks gestation for that matter let's use 28 weeks as an example if the baby is born at 28 weeks gestation we would have a team of people probably the consultant, but certainly as a registrar and another junior doctor, there will be two nurses with the baby anticipating. As soon as the baby is born, uh, we collect the baby in a plastic bag or the, the uh, new health bag and allow for at least a minute of delayed cord clamping. So you have taken care of delayed cord clamping and you have also hopefully taken care of the temperature in the meantime, you have your resuscitator temperature set quite high, uh, at least at 38 degrees centigrade, so that your your under wall, your the under mattress heater is up as well as your overhead heater is up. And and soon after the baby is born, what we tend to do is, you know, your resuscitation. The things is a baby with spontaneous breathing. It's okay if not. You give five inflation breaths followed by ventilation breaths. And in case of a baby who needs intubating, the most experienced person will intubate the baby. If the baby is showing spontaneous breathing, then we continue to administer PEEP. And PEEP can vary anywhere between four to six. You can go up to even, I, I give CPAP pressures of up to eight if needed, you know, uh, when the baby is admitted to the unit. But during delivery, maybe up to six, we give and sustained PEEP, ensuring that you have not lost the PEEP uh, at all during that time. And once a baby is stabilized, we move the baby. If you have the option of actually administering PEEP on the unit, uh, in a, a proper uh, CPAP, then you should do that. If you have to ventilate the baby, then give surfactant immediately, making sure. And the surfactant, we give the dose of 200 uh, milligrams per kilogram. I know people give various doses. We tend not to throw away a uh, vial because of the costs effectively, but roughly about 200 mil. Uh, yeah. And and, yeah, and and those are the basic some of the basic uh, interventions that we do. Thank you very much. You have nicely summed it up. <laughs> uh, 
uh, over to manoj you want to <laughs> i am reminded of uh, uh, the anniversary session we had in june where professor we had two legends that day professor ola sockstead and richard, uh, professor richard polin and the session seems to go on and on and uh, like they were taking it in sport even though they both of them were in a big hurry so all uh, friends all seat things need to come to an end it was a very fruitful discussion we had after a very extensive um, uh, talk so uh, thank you thank you so much uh, professor sandeep for uh, this wonderful talk we look forward to hearing more from you in the future hopefully uh, and in uh, if you are able to m m meet us in person at the iap neocon or at least a virtual session thank you uh, i would also like to thank uh, the wonderful moderation done by um, uh, dr ravi shankar and dr mamda jaju sir madam you have done an excellent job uh, and uh, like it was uh, so nice that the time just flew uh, at the end uh, of course i would like to uh, uh, like to thank all the respected attendees who have been with us since uh, june 2020 now almost one and a half years and then still we have uh, i mean like uh, the uh, and fortunately the and uh, we the sessions uh, seem to be interesting for all of them so it is so nice to have a few, uh, have all of you may and uh, uh, invite you all for the next session which is again due uh, very soon that is uh, after two weeks we have the next session uh, on 9th of uh, december that is on uh, uh, Of uh, recent advances in ROP, and the uh, the speaker is Professor Anne Sexton from Sweden. So uh, please do join us after two weeks, same Thursday, same time, seven thirty. Until then, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mamba. Okay.